Hello and welcome to lesson 11 of 20 in the Ursa Campus Breakdown course on Introductory Statistics and Probability. This is Module 3, Random Variables and Probability Distributions, Part 1, Introduction to Discrete Probability Distributions. Let's get started. In this module, we build upon the fundamental concepts of probability which were covered in the previous module and focus our attention on how experiments can be modeled using random variables and the probability distributions they follow. The topics covered in this module include introduction to discrete probability distributions, special discrete probability distributions, continuous random variables and in particular the normal distribution and sampling distributions and including the very important central limit theorem. The focus of this lesson is on experiments whose possible outcomes fall across distinct countable values i.e. those whose results are modeled using discrete random variables and probability distributions. The topics covered in this lesson include discrete random variables and their probability distributions, expected value, variance, and standard deviation of discrete random variables, and operations on random variables. As we have already seen in the previous module on probability, for many common experiments, the random variables of interest are restricted to specific and countable values. In example one, say that a person is looking for work and submits applications for three different jobs. Let X equal the number of job offers that result from these three applications. So the possible values of X would be 0, 1, 2, or 3. Now we say that X is a discrete random variable because the possible values are limited only to specific ones. In this case, all the whole numbers between zero and three. The above is an example of a discrete random variable that is also finite. In other words, the possible values for X are not unlimited in number. It is possible, however, that a discrete random variable can be infinite as the next example illustrates. In example two, we now consider the situation where a person is looking for work and submits applications for jobs until a job offer is obtained. In this case, the relevant random variable is now, well, we can use X again. And in this case, we would say that we would let X equal the number of job applications required to obtain a job offer. Now, if you think about it, it's kind of the same activity in the sense that in both examples, we have a person that may be looking for a job. That might be the goal. However, the experiment is actually different here in the sense that the person applies until they get a, a successful job um, application. In other words, until they get a job offer. So in this particular case, the possible values of X are as follows. First of all, one difference is that the minimum number is no longer zero. Because in order to get a job offer, you have to make at least one application. So the values of X start with a minimum value of one instead of zero. So it starts at one and then it goes two, three, et cetera. And you see, in this case, you see the dot, 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 which implies that X has, is, is, has an infinite number of possible values because there's theoretically no upper bound because in theory, the person can keep trying and making applications without success. So in that sense, there's no upper limit to the number of job applications needed to secure an offer. When a random variable has been defined with respect to an experiment, we are typically interested in knowing the likelihood of each of its different possible values. This breakdown of total probability into each possible result is called the probability distribution of the random variable, and we use PD as the shorthand for this. The main features of a random variable's probability distribution are as follows. And you can see uh, below in the example that we'll be looking at that there's a table there that is that represents the probability distribution. One column lists the possible values X of the random variable. 
and another column lists the corresponding probabilities for each of these x values and we use the notation probability so we have p bracket big x equals little x and you can think of the big x as the overall random variable itself which contains all of the possible values and you can think of the little x as representing a specific value that x can take on now a really a very important property of all probability distributions like this is that the sum of the p x equals little x column has to equal one in other words the sum of all of the individual probabilities has to add up to total probability which is of course one so in example three we return to the situation of example one so let's say that based on historical data the probability distribution of x equaling the number of job offers resulting from three applications is as follows and we see in the table below we can see the distribution we've got the first column on the left shows the possible x values 0 1 2 and 3 and then the numbers in the right column and those are the probabilities for each of those x values that would be based on historical data so you could see here that the probability of getting no job offers is 0.5 and then the probability of getting one offer is 0.3 and the probability of getting two offers is 0.15 and finally the probability of getting three offers out of three is 0.05 and that has to add up to one and we see that it does a probability distribution such as this one which is based upon observed or historical data is called an empirical probability distribution A probability histogram provides a graphical representation of a probability distribution for a discrete random variable. So example four shows the histogram corresponding to the previous example where we have empirical data for X equaling the number of job offers resulting from three applications. So we see again the uh, on the slide here we see once again that uh, the probability distribution table and to the right we see the histogram which is simply a a graphical representation of this data and we see the rectangles going from zero through three and the heights of the rectangles are the probabilities and of course those heights have to add up to one it's often useful to track the accumulated probability up to and including each possible value of a random variable this calculation, which represents the probability that that big X is, or the random variable X, is less than or equal to some value little x, is called the cumulative distribution function of the random variable, and we use the shorthand notation CDF for this. It is often included as an additional third column in the in the PD table for the random variable, as illustrated below for the previous example. So example five shows once again that same probability distribution except this time you can see the third column is the cdf for each x value and you can notice the following about the cdf now you can see the cdf always the cdf for the lowest value of x will always simply equal to the probability for that value that's why since the probability of x equaling 0 is 0.5 so is the cdf for 0 it is 0.5 and then the way it works as you go down the list uh, as X increases is that we accumulate the probability so the probability that X equals 1 is 0.3 so the CDF value is equal to the probability that X is less than or equal to 1 which equals the 0.5 from above plus the 0.3 which is 0.8 so you see that we accumulate the value we, we add up all of the values at or above in the P column the second column to get our CDF value of 0.8 and then when X equals 2 we have an additional probability to add a 0.15 so the CDF goes up to 0.95 and notice then that when we add the last probability of 0.05 to X equals 3 that brings us to a CDF value of 1 the CDF of X always equals 1 for the greatest value of X because from this value onwards there are no other possible values for the random variable in other words we've accumulated all of our total probability of 1 
As with data sets such as those we looked at in module one, one of the things we are typically interested in knowing about any random variable is its average value, i.e. its mean. The mean of a random variable is called its expected value and is expressed and calculated as follows. We use the, um, the terminology here, the notation E of X, so E bracket X, which is read the expected value of X. And the expected value of X is equal to the sum for all of the X values of each X value X times the probability that X equals that value X. The expected value E of X, therefore, is simply the sum of each possible value of X multiplied by its corresponding probability. This gives us the weighted average of X, the random variable X, weighted in terms of the relative probabilities of the different X values. E of X is also commonly referred to as the mean of X, which is denoted by the symbol mu subscript X. In other words, E of X equals mu subscript X. So they're intergen interchangeable terms. And I think it's a very good idea that you're comfortable with, with um, switching from one to another because you'll see um, both E of X and mu of X often uh, used very, very much interchangeably in common uh, statistical discourse. So you want to be definitely want to be comfortable with um, the idea of the, those two terms being used to represent the same thing. The following example illustrates the calculation of the expected value of X. In example six, we are asked to calculate the expected value of X for the previous example based upon the given empirical probability distribution. So we see again here uh, that same uh, uh, probability distribution for X. This is for the uh, three job applications where X is the number of job offers that result. So we apply the rule that the expected value of X is simply that sum product of taking each X value and timesing it by its probability and then we add those up. So we see that the expected value of X will equal 0 times 0.5 plus 1 times 0.3 plus 2 times 0.15 plus three times 0 0.05. So we're just multiplying across rows and then adding the result down uh, for, for all of the rows. And so we end up with zero plus 0 0.3 plus 0 0.3 plus 0 0.15, and we get a, a total of 0 0.75. Therefore, the expected number of job offers from three applications based on this historical data or empirical data is 0 0.75. Now note, if a person makes three job applications, obviously it's, it's actually impossible that they will get exactly 0 0.75 job offers because you can only get a whole number of job offers. You can get zero or one or two or three job offers. And in fact, we've defined this as a discrete random variable precisely because uh, there are only specific values that uh, the random variable can take on. It can't take on those in-between values of which 0 0.75 happens to be one of those values. What the value of 0 0.75 here represents, though, is it's the average result if this experiment was repeated over and over again. So one way you could think of this is if that, uh, say, a large number of people or a multitude of people who are in a similar population from which this empirical data was collected, if they were to go out and make three job applications in this particular uh, population, uh, then we would expect that the average number of job offers among that group of people would be 0 0.75. It would be the average of all of the people's results. Other than the expected value of x or the, or the mean of x, mu, subscript x, which gives us a measure of central tendency for a random variable, we're also typically interested in measuring the relative dispersion or spread of values pertaining to any random variable. The measures of dispersion commonly used, as you've seen previously, are the variance and the standard deviation, which we denote here by V of X and SD of X. The variance of a random variable is calculated as follows. So V of X is equal to, it's the sum, it's similar to the calculation for the expected value or the mean, but instead of timesing each X value by its probability, 
what we times the probability by for each value is the square of the deviation, which is x minus mu. So the variance of x is the sum of the square of x minus mu times the probability for that particular x value. So what the variance of x actually is, it's the weighted average of x minus mu squared, i.e. it equals the expected value of x minus mu squared. The standard deviation of a random variable is simply the square root of the variance, as we've discussed previously. So the SD of x is equal to the square root of V of x. So it's just equal to the square root of the sum of, for each x, x minus mu squared times P x equals little x. The variance and standard deviation of a random variable are also commonly denoted respectively by the symbols sigma squared and sigma, as we've talked about previously as well. The following example illustrates the calculation of the variance and the standard deviation of a random variable x. In example seven, we're asked to calculate vx and sdx for the previous job applications example, based upon that, that given em empirical probability distribution. So we see again that table and we go ahead and we calculate. Uh, it's very similar, it's a sum product, but what we do this time is we take, in each case, the difference. Now, notice that we need to know what mu is, and we calculated mu previously. That was the expected value. So we use the 0 0.75. So for each x value, we simply take the difference between the value and 0 0.75 and the mean. We square it, and then we times that square of the deviation by the corresponding probability for that x value. So what we get is 0, point, 0 minus 0.75 all squared times 0 0.5 plus 1 minus 0.75 all squared times 0.3 plus 2 minus 0.75 all squared times 0.15 plus finally 3 minus 0.75 all squared times 0 0.05. And so what we get then for the variance is 0 0.7875. And then the standard deviation we just take for the standard deviation we simply take the square root of that so the standard deviation will equal the square root of 0 0.7875 which rounds to three um, decimal places rounds to or three significant digits as well 0 0.887 another formula for calculating sigma squared that is often a shortcut alternative to the previously mentioned formula is the following. Sigma squared equals the expected value of x squared minus the square of the expected value of x, or the sum for all x values of x squared times the probability of x minus mu squared. To use this formula, it's helpful to add an additional column for x squared to the PD. The following example shows how the variance in the previous example is calculated this way. So for example eight, we have the same table for the random variable x, except we add a column for x squared. So for the x values zero, one, two, and three, the corresponding x squared values are zero, one, four, and nine. So therefore, sigma squared equals 0 times 0 0.5 plus 1 times 0 0.3 plus 4 times 0 0.15 plus 9 times 0 0.05 minus 0.75 squared, which equals 1.35 minus 0 0.5625, which equals 0 0.7875, which is the same value for sigma squared that we calculated previously. In example nine, we take a look at a casino game example. We have a roulette game here, which is one of the more common uh, types of games you might see in a casino. And uh, it's based upon a wheel, which is divided into numbered segments as follows. So in this particular roulette wheel, we've got um, the red numbers are the odd numbers from one through 19. The black numbers are the even numbers from 2 through 20, and there's one additional number that's green, and that is 0. 
The way the game works is that the roulette wheel is spun and a ball is dropped onto the spinning wheel with the ball having an equal likelihood of coming to rest in each of the numbered segments from 0 to 20. Each play of the game works via the following rules. First, a, pair, a player pays $1 to play and then chooses either red or black. And they can't choose green. Then the wheel is spun. If the ball lands on the color that the player has chosen, then they get back $2. If the ball lands on a different color, they get nothing back. In other words, they lose the $1 that they paid. And the question asks to calculate the expected net result to the player of playing this game, as well as the standard deviation of this result. We start by defining the random variable of interest. We let x equal the net result to the player of playing this game which gives us the following PD for X. Our table can include uh, an additional column on the left called outcome, and there's two possible outcomes for the player, win or lose. In both cases, the player starts by paying a dollar to play. So the X value for winning is minus $1 plus $2, which equals plus $1. And for losing, x equals minus $1 plus $0, which equals minus $1. Now, to figure out the probabilities for the x values, we note that there is a total of 21 spots on the table, 10 each for red and black, and the player can bet on one of these two colors. And there's, then there's that one additional green spot, and that gives us our total of 21 spots. So the probability of winning is equal to the number of spots of the color that the player bets on, which would be 10. So 10 over 21. And the probability of losing would be the other 11 spots over 21. So 11 over 21. Therefore, the expected value of x equals plus 1 times 10 over 21 plus minus 1 times 11 over 21 which equals 10 over 21 minus 11 over 21 or minus 1 over 21, which rounds to three sig figs to minus 0 0.0476. The standard deviation of x is equal to the square root of the variance of x. Since there's only two x values here, it would seem simpler to use the first of, of the two formulas for of the two formulas for variance of x that we discussed previously, and that's the one where we take this, uh, we take the sum product of the squares of the differences between each x value and the expected value, the mean, times the probability of the x value. So we get standard deviation of x equals the square root of the square of one minus minus one over 21, and when you minus a minus, that's the same as adding times 10 over 21 plus the square of minus 1 minus minus 1 over 21 times 11 over 21 which all works out to equal the square root of 440 over 441 which rounds to three sig figs to 0 0.999 dollars when a random variable is multiplied by a constant k the expected value and variance and standard deviation of the transformed random variable are calculated as follows. The expected value of kx is equal to k times the expected value of x. In other words, we can factor out the constant k. The variance of kx is equal to k squared times the variance of x. In other words, here we factor out the square of the constant k. And so the standard deviation of kx is equal to the absolute value of k times the standard deviation of x. The reason for the absolute value is because the constant k can be negative, but the standard deviation can't. So in the event that the constant k is negative, we use the absolute value to make sure that the standard deviation is positive. In example 10, we're asked to calculate the expected value and standard deviation of the net result for the casino if 100 bets are made by a player at a roulette table such as the one described in example 9. So to answer this, we recall that x is defined as the net result to a player 
of playing the roulette game one time. And now we define the random variable y, which equals the net results to the casino of a player playing the roulette game 100 times. Therefore, y equals minus 100 times x. And the reason for the minus sign is because every dollar gained by the player is a dollar lost by the casino and vice versa. So therefore, the expected value of y equals the expected value of minus 100x, which equals minus 100 times the expected value of x, which equals minus 100 times minus 1 over 21, which equals positive 100 over 21, which rounds to three sig figs to $4.76. dollars and the standard deviation of y is equal to the standard deviation of minus 100x, which equals the absolute value of minus 100 times the standard deviation of x, which equals plus 100 times the root of 440 over 441, which rounds to three sig figs to $99.9. .9. The following additional rules apply to expected value and variance or standard deviation of any constant value. And we use the symbol K to represent a constant again. The expected value of any constant K is just equal to K. In other words, the expected value of any constant must equal itself since it never varies from this value. And using the same logic, the variance uh, and standard deviation of a, any constant k must equal zero. And the reason for that, of course, is that uh, constants don't vary at all. That's exactly what the definition of a constant is. So variance and standard deviation, since they're measures of variation, must have a value of, a value of zero for something that's constant. Now, these above rules can be combined with the ones, the more general ones listed in the previous slide to give us the following expanded, more general rules where x is a random variable and a and b are constants. So the expected value of a times x plus b would equal a times the expected value of x plus b. And the variance of a times x plus b would equal a squared times the variance of x and nothing else because the variance of b is zero. And so the standard deviation of ax plus b is simply equal to the square root of that, which is the uh, absolute value of a times the standard deviation of x. And the next example illustrates the use of these formulas. In example 11, the minimum temperature on the day of the spring equinox in a particular location is modeled via a random variable with a mean of 15 degrees Celsius and a standard deviation of 3 degrees Celsius. And we're asked to calculate the mean and standard deviation of the corresponding minimum spring equinox temperature at the same place in degrees Fahrenheit. So we start our answer by defining a couple of random variables here. <clears throat> C is the minimum temperature on the day of the spring equinox in degrees Celsius and F is the same thing measured in degrees Fahrenheit. Now the formula which relates temperature in degrees Celsius to temperature in degrees Fahrenheit is a well-known formula that goes as follows, F equals 9 fifths C plus 32. This same formula therefore relates the above defined random variables C and F. In other words, the F and the C in this formula is the F and C um, from that we've defined above. So the expected value of F would then equal the expected value of the 9 fifths C plus 32, which would equal 9 fifths times the expected value of C plus 32, which equals 9 fifths times 15 plus 32, which works out to be 27 plus 32 or 59 degrees Fahrenheit. And the standard deviation of F would equal the standard deviation of 9 fifths C plus 32, which would equal 9 fifths standard deviation of C, which equals 9 fifths times 3, which equals 27 over 5, which equals 5.4 degrees Fahrenheit. A final set of rules is given here for the linear combination of random variables. 
If x and y are random variables and a and b are constants, then the following rules apply. For any random variables x and y, the expected value of ax plus by would equal a times the expected value of x plus b times the expected value of y. And for random variables x and y that are independent with respect to each other, we have the rule for variance. The variance of ax plus by would equal a squared variance x plus b squared variance y, which would then give us the standard deviation of ax plus by equaling the square root of a squared variance of x plus b squared variance of y, which would be, which we could also write as the square root of a times the standard deviation of x all squared plus b times standard deviation of y all squared. These rules are illustrated in the following example. Example 12. On sunny summer days, a reservoir's water level drops by an average of five centimeters with a standard deviation of one centimeter. Meanwhile, on rainy summer days, the reservoir rises by an average of 10 centimeters with a standard deviation of two centimeters. Assuming that the amount of rise or fall of the reservoir is independent from one day to the next, calculate the mean and standard deviation of the net change in the level of the reservoir after a summertime week with four sunny days and three rainy days. So to answer this, we start by defining some random variables. If we let X and Y represent respectively the net change in the level of the reservoir on a sunny or rainy summer day, and let Z equal the net change in the level of the reservoir over a summertime week with four sunny days and three rainy days, and X, Y, and Z are all measured in centimeters. So by definition then, z would equal 4x plus 3y. And so we can calculate as follows. The expected value of z would equal the expected value of 4x plus 3y, which equals 4 times the expected value of x plus 3 times the expected value of y, which equals 4 times minus 5 plus 3 times 10 equals minus 20 plus 30, which finally equals 10 centimeters. And the standard deviation of z equals the standard deviation of 4x plus 3y, which equals the square root of the square of 4 times the standard deviation of x plus the square of 3 times the standard deviation of y, which ends up equaling, uh, which is equal to uh, 4, the square root of the square of 4 times 1 plus the square of 3 times 2, which equals the square root of 4 squared plus 6 squared, which equals the square root of 16 plus 36, which equals the square root of 52, which finally equals 2 times the square root of 13, which rounds to 3 sig figs to 7.21 centimeters. The following is a set of practice questions meant to provide a review of the material covered in this lesson. Question one, let X equal the sum of the numbers showing when two fair dice are rolled. Calculate the mean, variance, and standard deviation of X. To answer this question requires us to be able to determine the PD of X. To do this, we first consider the sample space of possible outcomes from rolling two fair dice. As we've discussed previously about rolling two dice, the sample space is equal to the set of outcomes from the lowest of one and one to the highest of six and six. And the number of elements in the sample space is equal to six squared, which equals 36. And since the dice are fair, each of these 36 different possible outcomes are equally likely. So therefore, the probability for any x value is equal to the number of uh, ways that x value can occur divided by the number of ways in the sample space. In other words, nx over ns, which equals nx over 36. The possible values of x are from 2 
2, 3, 4, etc., all the way through 12. So we can calculate the PD of X as follows. The table for the PD of X starts on the left with uh, the X column showing all the values from 2 through 12. Next, we have the outcomes that correspond to each X value. And we can see here there's a there's a symmetry that's the the smallest and largest values of x uh, 2 and 12 have only one outcome each and as you as we move towards the middle from either the top or bottom we we can see that the number of outcomes grows by one each step of the way so we end up with x equals 2 and x equals 12 each having a probability equal to 1 out of 36 and that can that grows one at a time until we get to the maximum probability for x equals 7 of 6 over 36 and we can confirm that the sum of those probabilities equals 36 over 36 which equals 1 so now we're ready to to calculate first we calculate the expected value of x which equals to the sum of x all, some of the x values times their probabilities, which equals the sum of the x values times the n of x over n of s. Now, each of the x values has the same n of s equal to 36, so we can factor that out as a 1 over 36 and multiply it by the sum of each x value times its n x. So that gives us 1 over 36 times 2 times 1 plus 3 times 2 plus 4 times 3 plus 5 times 4, plus 6 times 5, plus 7 times 6, plus 8 times 5, plus 9 times 4, plus 10 times 3, plus 11 times 2, plus 12 times 1, all of which gives us 252 over 36, which equals 7. Similarly, the variance of x, we'll use the first formula we discussed in this lesson. It equals to the sum for each x value of the square of the difference between the x value and the mean times the probability of the x value. And once again, as we develop out this formula, we can factor out uh, the 1 over 36, giving us the sum of all of the x minus mu squared times nx. And so ultimately, that ends up giving us uh, a final answer of 35 over 6, or 5 and 5 6, or 5.83 repeated. And then to get the standard deviation of x, we simply take the square root of 35 over 6, which rounds to, to 3 sig figs, rounds to 2.42. Question two, a game consists of flipping a biased coin where the player wins $5 if it comes up heads and loses $3 if it comes up tails. The expected value to a player of playing this game is a loss of $1 for each play. Calculate the probability of heads and probability of tails for this coin. So we start by defining a random variable. We let x equal the net result to the player of playing this game. And then we, we can represent the probability of getting heads with little h, the variable little h. And then since the sum of the probabilities of heads and tails must be 1, therefore the probability of tails we can denote as 1 minus little h. And that gives us the following PD of x. We have our outcomes of heads and tails with respectively x values of plus 5 and minus 3 for the $5 uh, win and the three dollar loss respectively and the probabilities that go along with that are the little h and one minus little h and so rather than solve for the expected value of x since we know it's minus one we actually set up an equation where we do the sum product we use the formula for expected value of x and we equate it to our given expected value of, we're told it's a loss of $1, so we equate that with minus 1. So we end up with plus 5h minus, uh, plus 5 little h minus 3 
times 1 minus little h equals minus 1. And the rest of this solution involves solving this equation for little h. And so doing that, we get 5 times little h minus 3 plus 3 times little h equals minus 1, which gives us 8 little h equals 2. Therefore, little h equals 1 over 4. Therefore, the probability of heads equals 1 over 4. And then subtracting from 1, we get the probability of tails equals 3 over 4. I hope that you found this video helpful. If you liked it and would like to see more from Ursa Campus, then please subscribe. And also, if you'd like to send your feedback, that's always welcome too. Thanks for watching, and I wish you well with your studies.